Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast, conversations about creating a culture of activity. My name is John Zimmerman. I'm the founder of the Active Towns Initiative, and I'm honored to serve as your host each week on this podcast journey. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Today is Friday, October 1st, 2021, and I'm excited to share this special conversation I recently had with Ken Rose, Branch Chief for Physical Activity and Health within the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We discuss the Active People Healthy Nation Initiative, which recently launched in 2020, as well as some of the underlying challenges and barriers making physical activity difficult for many people, such as the lack of access to activity assets like parks and trails, and limited mobility choices. At the heart of the initiative is the goal of getting 27 million more people to meet the recommended physical activity guidelines by 2027. But before we roll into that conversation and dive into those details, please allow me a moment to say that this episode is once again being brought to you by the generous contributions of our donors, sponsors, and monthly patrons on our Patreon page. I just have to send out a huge, sincere thank you to everyone who has stepped up to donate. I simply could not produce this content and cover the overhead to keep Active Towns rolling without your support. I truly appreciate every single donation made. Now, if you too would like to make a contribution, just head over to my website at activetowns.org and navigate over to the donation page. And it's worth mentioning that yes, there are a few other ways that you can help support the effort by one, subscribe to the podcast on your preferred listening platform. Two, subscribe to my Active Towns YouTube channel. Just be sure to click on the bell next to the subscribe button so that you'll be alerted when I post new videos. And finally, number three, help me spread the word about the Active Towns Initiative and our content within your personal and professional networks as appropriate. Thank you so very much for tuning in and for whatever support you're able to provide as I strive to grow this movement to create a culture of activity for all ages and abilities. Okay, let's get this conversation with Ken Rose rolling. Well, Ken, it's so wonderful to connect with you here today. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's uh, it's an honor to be able to talk to folks who care so much about this work. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Ditto. And uh, I, I tell you what, let's to get us started, uh, just share a little bit about yourself and your role there at the Centers for De- Disease Control and Prevention. I always like to make sure that we uh, include the prevention part. I uh, currently lead the physical activity and health program uh, at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, We run a national initiative called Active People Healthy Nation. uh, My particular scientific expertise is in uh, how the built environment can help people integrate physical activity into their daily lives. So put another way, it's sort of how do the places or how can the places that we live provide safe and easy choices to be physically active, like, you know, going for a walk or, or taking a bike someplace. Yeah. Fantastic. And when you look at your branch and the, the activities that you're doing, um, obviously the, the active people and, and healthy nation initiative is a big part of that. Can you tell us a little bit more about that initiative? Yeah. Well, I should have started by saying we also run uh, the national initiative called Active People Healthy Nation. Uh, we we uh, announced that publicly uh, in January of 2020, uh, and it is a national initiative to get 27 million people more physically active by 2027. Um, and our goal is to promote, you know, promote evidence-based strategies to increase physical activity, or what I like to call strategies that work. So. You know, to do that, we have to build a national movement of culture change that really embraces the incredible benefits of physical activity and helps build the uh, cultural support for those strategies. So, you know, we're working to engage many different sectors at multiple geographic levels through partnerships between sectors like say the public health sector and the land use and transportation sector or 
the public health sector and the uh, parks and rec sector and so forth. So we know that uh, for us to be successful to create this national movement, we, um, we have to uh, really implement these evidence-based strategies that we have at every level, at the local level, the tribal level, the state level, the national level, and to reach our goal of 27 million people uh, or 27, more, uh, 27 million more people physically active by 2027, we're going to um, have to increase or encourage approaches that specifically address equitable and inclusive access, regardless of age, race, education, socioeconomic status, disability status, and so forth. Um, so to be successful, uh, to get to 27 million uh, more people, we have got to address the inequities in our society uh, that uh, prevent people from being physically active. Yeah, yeah. And I know looking at some of the, uh, the wonderful PDF uh, documents that you ha have out on the website, uh, there's, you know, statistics out there like access to parks and things of that nature where, you know, that's part of what you're talking about with that, the inequities there. Yeah, I mean, there's a dramatic inequity uh, across the board um, in uh, communities impacted by health equity. Uh, when you look at these, the, the access issues, it's not just access to parks. It's, um, as you probably know, uh, four lane arterials, uh, you know, dangerous roads. Um, you know, in a in a range of other barriers that exist in in neighborhoods uh, that are impacted by health equity. Yeah, yeah. So one of the favorite quotes that I pulled off of uh, some of your materials out there is actually from your uh, your 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 division director, uh, Dr. Ruth Peterson, and and she basically says if you could package physical activity into a pill it would be the most effective drug on the market. And so I think that actually partially answers my next question for you, which is why is this work important? Well, I love to talk about this because most people know that physical activity is good for them, but they don't really know how good it is for them. And, and you know, your quote is a good one. It's uh, one that uh, it really uh, kind of personifies the benefits of physical activity. But it is really important to know that physical activity is one of the best things that you can do for your health today. And almost anyone can go out today for a short walk or, or a short roll. And so it is something that you can do today to promote your own health. Uh, when people are physically active, they receive immediate and long-term health benefits. So immediately physical activity can improve uh, sleep quality, reduce symptoms of anxiety, and reduce blood pressure. So, you know, going for a single walk today, uh, you know, is really a great way to improve your health. It, you know, and if you can improve your anxiety, reduce your blood pressure, and improve your sleep, then you're going to see other concomitant or associated benefits to your health. So, we all know, for example, that sleep quality in and of itself is important to your health. So if you can do something that improves your sleep quality, then you're kind of getting a uh, double bang for your buck. So over the longer term, physical activity has profound impacts on chronic diseases uh, like diabetes, like heart disease, like uh, you know um, several different types of cancers. And so it not only helps prevent those chronic diseases, it helps people who have them manage them better. Um, and if you go online, you'll see story after story of people who, who, where physical activity has had an impact on the management of um, their conditions that is consistent with other types of, of treatment. Um, I should also note that it is really important to note that uh, over the longer term, um, physical activity also improves brain health and reduces symptoms of cognitive decline. And when you look at that field and you look at um, you know, the interventions or, or the prevention strategies that are available, there are really very few. Um, and so physical activity is really an important component of brain health and cognitive um, health as, as people age. And then for younger folks, um, physical activity actually uh, increases academic achievement. And, um, and then when you go to the other end of the age, uh, uh, range, it reduces falls in adults. So you're getting bookends on both sides of that, where obviously academic achievements is essential and important to uh, young people, and reducing falls in older adults 
is also a really important, as as you know, uh, important um, not only quality of life strategy but healthcare cost strategy as well. So I should also note that in addition, um, emerging data on COVID-19 and physical activity are showing that physical inactivity, and that means getting no physical activity at all, so doing nothing beyond you know, what you need to do to get through your daily lives, showing that physical inactivity is an important risk factor for severe COVID-19 complications or outcomes. So one study that was recent, re recently released um, analyzing uh, Kaiser uh, uh, data from California showed that adults uh, reported who reported meeting aerobic physical activity guidelines, which I'll talk about in a minute, of about 115 minutes uh, of moderate physical activity a week, had less severe COVID-19 outcomes. And so people who did some weekly activity, even if they didn't meet our guidelines, also had less severe outcomes. And so when you looked at what was the single, one of the single most modifiable risk factors, something that you could do today to reduce your risk for severe COVID outcomes, physical inactivity came to the top of the list. So going out and doing, you know, going from doing nothing to doing something. Um, so, uh, when people ask, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we mean by, you know, what you need for benefits to physical activity, or, or how much do you need for to to uh, accrue benefits. Um, so, when people ask how much physical activity you need, the answer is that really any amount of physical activity is good for you. Uh, but over time, uh, so so what I would say is that over time, some physical activity is better than none, of course, but you get even greater health benefits uh, when you meet the federal guidelines. So um, we have published uh, what we call the second edition of the physical activity guidelines for Americans. Everything I'll say here is is uh, uh, contained in much more detail in that document. And if you want to dig deeper, I would just Google second edition physical activity guidelines for Americans. Or if you have show notes, I can um, drop those, drop that link to you later. But what, what they what they say is um, that uh, adults need to get about 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity for per week. So that's like, you know, just going for a walk and getting your breathing rate up a little bit. Um, and it, it isn't really that intense. It's just going for a brisk walk fast enough to get the breathing rate up. If you're really, uh, if you're really ambitious and you want to get, a, uh, you just want to get out there and be vigorous and get the heart rate up quite a bit then, um, you know, just uh, uh, 90 minutes a week is enough. So, um, but uh, it really, the thing to note here is it doesn't really matter how you do it um, from an, you know, you can do it any way you want. So you can go out and get, say, for example, you 100, um, 150 minutes, uh, you could go out for 15, 10 minute walks, um, or you could go out for one, 150 minute moderate bike ride. You, you know, the, the point that the guidelines uh, communicate is that you can do it however you want. The important thing is just to get out and do it in some form or fashion. Um, so uh, I also want to say that uh, it is important to note that we have data that show that when you create or modify environments to make it easier for people to walk or for or take take a bike or use public transit, transit you usually have to walk to, so that's why it's important, or visit parks. We know that um, it helps to increase physical activity across the population. So it makes sense that making it easier for people to be active in their communities also increases physical activity in their communities. And so this can be done by connecting ways to walk, bike, or take transit, as I said, to everyday destinations, so such as schools, shops, parks, um, places of worship. And it, at CDC, we call this concept or this strategy activity-friendly routes to everyday destinations. And it is something that we invest uh, all, you know, our programmatic resources in when it comes to uh, promoting physical activity. So I should also say that uh, research also shows that these strategies to invest in activity-friendly routes to everyday destinations um, uh, can improve local economies, uh, can increase employment opportunities, can support 
neighborhood revitalization and improved safety. And we'd be happy to talk about those if you'd like. But um, that's, I think, just a kind of a quick snapshot of, you know, why we're so excited about physical activity, because it is such an amazing way to uh, improve your health and your quality of life. Yeah. And, and I'd like to amplify just a couple of things that I that I heard there is that, you know, when we think of physical activity, oftentimes in society, we think of, you know, hard workouts and exercise and things of that nature. So the fact that you really made a point of saying that, hey, even low to moderate levels of physical activity help, and even at fairly <laughs> incredibly small amounts can actually help improve if you're not physically active now. So that's that was one thing I wanted to amplify and 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 reinforce for the audience. And you had asked earlier, you know, who the audience is. It's actually an international audience. It's really quite fascinating, you know, what this new era of communication is like with the with podcasts and everything. So yeah, we've got at least 25 to 30 percent of the entire audience is spread around the world internationally. Um, but the other thing that I really liked what you were mentioning there was you really highlighted some of the short-term benefits as well as the long-term benefits. So, it, you know, we can sometimes, you know, think back to, especially when we get diseased focused, we look at our chronic diseases and things of that nature. But the point being, and you made this point, is that there's immediate benefits of being able to just get out and get moving. And the other, the final thing that I wanted to amplify here, and, and we'll we'll pivot and talk about this a little bit, is that you 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 sort of brought up the fact that um, with the activity friendly routes to everyday destinations, that there's some partnerships that are happening here because obviously that is you know frequently stuff that's beyond the control of any one individual. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the, those types of partnerships you're, you're working with and, 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 and how, I, I guess the, the extension of that is also how other people can, can think about, uh, you know, helping to improve the environment within their cities. Yeah. So, you know, thanks. Uh, I do just really want to reinforce that, you know, uh, any level of physical activity is good for you. And these immediate benefits are, are, are ben you know, this is the immediate benefits are benefits that people don't really, based on research that we've done, that's not a benefit that people normally associate with physical activity. And so particularly in the stressful times that we experience, you know, it is something that you can do today to manage stress. So um, just reinforce that. Well, can I interject one thing real quick, Ken, uh, is just to say that I think one of the things that we've seen with the, the pandemic happening is just the, you know, explosion of people getting outdoors and getting, you know, you know, at least, you know, here in Austin, Texas, in our neighborhood, we've seen at least a tenfold increase in the number of people walking and biking in the neighborhood. And I think a big part of that was sort of an epiphany with a lot of people that there is that immediate short-term direct connection to, I feel better. I, I need to get out and, and get some activity in. So I've been in, in the midst of a devastating negative thing, such as a pandemic, uh, you know, from a behavior change perspective, I, I was like, whoa, this is, this is kind of cool because they're reinforcing that connection that you're just talking about right there. Yeah, and it is, you know, we um, actually uh, did some some information, uh, some collection, uh, national survey of uh, folks uh, last summer, so uh, 2020, to get a sense of, of what people were doing from a physical activity perspective. And while it was just a snapshot in time, uh, it, it, it did reveal interesting results that, uh, you know, some proportions of the population were getting more physical activity than they did before uh, the pandemic. And some proportions of the population were getting less physical activity than they did before the pandemic. So I think what we would, what we saw at least in that one snapshot is is kind of a mixed, uh, a mixed uh, picture of what was occurring. And um, probably, uh, you know, it's just important to note that um, it's important, and I'll talk, you know, I think it's important to note that everything that we do from the perspective of increasing access um, for physical activity, it's important to note that we need to do that uh, from an equitable perspective. So, um, and 
you know, I think to talk about our concept of activity-friendly routes to everyday destinations, you know, it does need to be started and underpinned with this need to address the, the um, uh, inequitable health impacts in the United States, at least, uh, that we see in specific places. Um, and so with our work, at least from, from CDC, we do focus and ask folks that we work with to focus on, as I said earlier, health ec equity strategies. We do um, work uh, from CDC's perspective in supporting this concept called activity-friendly routes to everyday destinations. I do want to acknowledge, and I'll talk a little bit later if I get a chance, about other strategies that have credible evidence of effectiveness for increasing physical activity. Um, I think it is important to note that Active People Healthy Nation recognizes seven strategies in our work at CDC and what we support in the field. We primarily support this concept that we call activity-friendly routes to everyday destinations, which is uh, one of those strategies. But it's an important strategy, as I noted, because there's evidence that it has population level impact. And we invest in that strategy because of its uh, credible scientific evidence of effectiveness, but also um, what we call scientific power or its impact in the field. It has the uh, ability to move entire, you know, change population levels of physical activity. So, and that means that, you know, we have to create uh, places for people to be active. Um, and so, as I said, bike paths and sidewalks to grocery stores, health clinics, shops, houses of worship, and so forth. Um, and, and, and we support it because we know it works. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit kind of about what we do within our division and how we support this work uh, within the United States. Um, I work for a part of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention called the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity. And we do exactly what that title uh, implies that we would do. We promote um, improved nutrition strategies such as breastfeeding and better food um, access for um, older um, populations. We uh, support, uh, and then we support physical activity on the other side. So everything I'm gonna talk about now has to do with what we support from the physical activity perspective. But so uh, we provide funding and technical support to state health departments uh, throughout the country to work in local communities in their states. We fund land-grant universities to work uh, through cooperative extension service in rural counties with 40% more of or 40% uh, more of obesity. So obesity rates with 40% or more. And then we work um, through community organizations through a program we call uh, racial and ethnic approaches to community health. Uh, as I said, they all work in places that are impacted, uh, work in places that are impacted by health equity, but that that is different depending on the community that you're in. And um, there is, there they range in diversity from working in small town, rural, or rural environments to working in suburban areas to working in neighborhoods within large cities. Um, and they work in a, a wide range of, uh, activities to support the strategy um, and you know as some examples uh, they're working to yield permanent changes like supporting the development of a community-wide bicycle or pedestrian plan um, or looking at the implementation of a complete streets policy at the local level or increasing safety and access around transit stops or um, supporting changes to land use uh, and zoning that increase access to destinations by reducing travel distances. Um, so as a couple, uh, I think as three examples of specific work that we're doing, uh, we supported Savannah, Georgia uh, to, uh, for the, so, so the other thing I would say is that our work is not building things. We're not building streets. We're not building, laying concrete or anything. We're supporting, um, health partners in the field to, to uh, do the, what I call the soft engagement. But um, so the soft, the management costs or the community engagement costs at local level. So for example, in Savannah, Georgia, one of our recipients is uh, supporting the community engagement and planning for a project they call Tied to Town, which is a project that is uh, designed to create a network of protected walking and bicycling trails uh, connecting all of the neighborhoods in Savannah 
really nice, um, important project. Uh, as another example, we're working on a similar effort in Cleveland, Ohio, to do uh, a protected uh, bike lane um, or a protected bikeway, I should say, and network across their city. And then a third is supporting the planning and community engagement for implementing uh, Main Street, uh, complete street in a small town in the state of Washington. So it, it ranges the gamut and geogra geograph geography, but it's similar in the type of work that it's supporting at the local level, bringing non-traditional partners to the table to support our goals and active people, healthy nation. Yeah. And I think that's so incredibly important to have that, you know, partnership involved with the, those groups, those local groups that are out there, uh, having been involved with this for, you know, pretty actively for the last 15 years, I can tell you that, you know, the communities need that additional backdrop, that, that backstop of credible assistance, you know, to be able to move some of these projects forward. And um, I'm glad you gave uh, the Tide to Town uh, folks a, a shout out there in Savannah. I know them and I, and I know that that would be a wonderful uh, asset, community asset, activity asset for that entire region. And uh, that's that's really, really good stuff. And and you're exactly right. I mean, too, it's it, you're not going to be exactly, you know, directly involved with the building of stuff, but reinforcing the powerful data that is behind what we know about physical activity helps bring the relevance to why those other entities, the, whether it's, you know, the, the, the local highways department and roads department, you know, it needs to be able to, you know, hold, have, you know, everybody kind of heading in the right direction in terms of making it safer for people to, you know, have activity friendly routes to everyday destinations. Those, those safe places, those safe routes. <laughs> One of the things that I thought of too, when you mentioned that the data showed that we, we saw some people uh, getting in less activity uh, during this time and, and what, immediately hit hit my 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 brain waves was you know my partner Laura because she would you know previously she was riding her bike to work every day <laughs> suddenly that that commute was gone and it affect, affected me too because I work here I work from home but I would actually ride my bike with her to work and then back in, in the morning so that I got my commute in even though you know I'm working from home and so I found myself having to like be very intentional about getting out the door, you know, breaking away from the video editing and the and the podcast editing and get out for a walk in the neighborhood. Uh, I, I do grocery shop by bike. And so, you know, making sure that I, you know, buy fresh vegetables and produce in small amounts. So I'm making multiple trips uh, out there because. We, we missed our commute. So we're, we're excited that she's back to riding her bike to, to work frequently. So that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. I had a per I had a similar personal experience. Yeah. It was a, uh, it was an interesting experience for me too, because I also have been a bicycle commuter personally. Um, and it's a fairly, a fairly long commute. Um, and I was in the same place and I actually had to make a conscious decision to go out for a walk every evening and one of the ways i did that and, it, and it's and I'm, I'm fortunate to live in a place that does have uh, what we call activity friendly routes to everyday destinations and similar to you the way i did this is i took a walk every evening and i made a point to stop by a local store uh, you know as part of that walk and and so if i you know i i would always have something i needed to pick up there but I also made myself walk the, you know, in my case, because I, I am a physical activity person and I should do this. I should model practice what I preach. So I was walking five miles a day um, to do this. And, 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 you know, it seems like that takes a lot of time. And, you know, if somebody were to say to me or, you know, before that, well, you know, I, you know, you should go walk five miles a day, five days a week. Um, and integrate it into your daily life. I'd say, that's really hard to do. I don't think I can do that. And it was interesting because it it wasn't didn't happen overnight. I started with two or three miles, you know, um, but ultimately I got in this routine and I didn't notice it just, 
it just seemed to be part of the daily ritual and it and it really helped me a lot just negotiate everything we have been that we've had to negotiate in in our roles at CDC so and what's great about what you just shared there is that a it, it answers partly my next question for you uh, because you know in both of our cases we needed needed to think about it more we needed to be more intentional about it and so what, what are some of the other reasons why so many people are inactive yeah I mean so I'm going to talk a little bit about the data here just so uh, folks uh, understand what the data at least in the United States is um, so we know every you know the thing is is when you do the you when you look at uh, the data people generally know that physical activity is good for them so this is not an issue generally speaking that people don't know that they should be active I think people do know that um, but Nonetheless, you know, we don't get the amount of physical activity that is recommended in the second edition that I mentioned earlier of, of the physical activity guidelines for Americans. Uh, we recommend, as I said, 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity and for kids to get 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity. I should also say that to fully meet guidelines, we also recommend that adults get two days of strength building uh, ex exercise a week and for um, adolescents to get three days. And, and that can really just be, uh, you know, um, working the major muscle groups. It doesn't, you know, we're not talking about going to a gym and, and lifting heavy weights or anything. It's, it's doing stuff that's manageable within your own personal perspective. Um, but, you know, the unfortunate reality is that very few people report meeting all of these guidelines. Only about one in four U.S. adults uh, meets uh, fully meets physical activity recommendations that I just met, mentioned, and one in six high school students reports meeting these guidelines. And what's worse is that recently published data collected before the pandemic shows that rates are falling for high school students. So I, th I think we do have... Um, really an issue in this country with uh, with, with um, youth physical activity and, and such. And so, and then when you look at the data from the perspective of, uh, uh, you know, um, demographics, populations with low income, people who are black or Hispanic, and residents of rural areas have comparatively lower rates of physical activity. And so when you look at inequities, those are places where you will see health disparities. Uh, and, and when you ask people why they aren't or why they don't get the physical activity that they need or why are they, you know, depending on where they are, why are they inactive? You know, generally, they respond by saying, I don't have enough time to do it or and or I don't have safe places to be active. So um, just as a, as a bit of just, you know, reporting some of the data that are associated with uh, why. Um, I'll talk a little bit about just safe places to be active. So when we look at, you know, as I said, you know, we want to be focused on play, uh, those those disparities. And so um, when you ask about barriers that say traffic pose for people being active, um, we, we learned from national uh, data collection. These are just a few data points. Only uh, one in five black people have access to streets that make walking safe and easy and have access to and have access to safe and convenient locations that support walking like parks um, only about 30 percent of uh, people who are black report that they live in a neighborhood where drivers followed the speed limit uh, only about half of people who are black report that distance and traffic safety, or excuse me, they report that when thinking about whether or not their kids, whether or not they want to allow their kids to walk or bike to school, uh, concept of safe routes to schools in the U.S., um, only half of that uh, population reports concerns about traffic and barriers associated with distance to school. And then finally, 85% uh, of adults who are black report uh, favoring or strongly favoring safer street design, even if it makes driving slower. 
So I, I report these data. Uh, these are data that uh, are reported from, uh, you know, uh, people who um, identify as being black. I, I will say that these data are very similar um, when you look at other subpopulations. But um, I, I just, uh, it's, it's, it's also really important to note that when you are trying to address these barriers of why people are not active in their communities, what it will take to integrate, you know, create conditions in which they can integrate physical activity into their daily lives, you know, it really is important to work with the underserved populations and to uh, work with them to understand what are the culturally appropriate solutions for those for those communities. And, and you know, I know that, um, you know, there's a lot. Uh, so, for example, you know, if you were going to do an open streets uh, program in a community, you know, it's important to work with the community in which you're going to have that open street to ensure that that open street is implemented in a way that's culturally appropriate for that community. Or, for example, if you're going to do a safe slow street or a network of safe slow streets um, that we saw a lot of in the pandemic, again, it's important to do the same thing communities need and, and how to implement them. But I think bottom line, you know, it is important to create the place people to be active. It's a necessary condition. If you can't, if you don't have a safe place to go be active and you, it's not easy to use, you're not going to, That is, those are the two primary barriers. There are more than there's there are more things that you need to address there, but those that's sort of the necessary condition to have in the first place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So when we look at the uh, the challenges that are out there, um, we know they're 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 massive in terms of trying to to you know make the environment healthier or you know more conducive to to physical activity. Um, how can just everyday people, you know, engage with and get involved with the initiative, with the Act, Active People Healthy Nation initiative? How, how, how do they plug in and get involved with that? Yeah, Active People Healthy Nation is a national movement, as I mentioned. And, you know, our goal is for people to get engaged, right? So uh, for us to be successful, it means that, you know, everyone listening to this podcast hopefully will go and join our movement. Um, and uh, so I'll talk a little bit about ways to engage with Active People Healthy Nation. We have three different types of folks that generally we work, you know, that we we ask to be engaged or we want everybody to engage, but people engage in different ways. So if you're an individual, you know, we want you to work in your community to influence your community. If you're part of an organization doing this work, we'd like for you to join um, and, uh, and inter integrate the work our work into your work if possible. And then, we, you know, we're looking to engage uh, uh, in, in the U.S. elected officials to support active people. So, uh, you know, I will say that, um, uh, you know, if you join, uh, one of the things that you will get immediately is you'll get our monthly newsletter that we curate on uh, and, and you get stuff that matters, I think. Um, you will also get resources that uh, if you're looking for local funding or other types of funding, we get those out to you as well. Um, and so uh, we have a number of other resources on, on our website that you can use to support the work in your own backyard. Uh, and I would also say that, you know, we, we want you to spread the word. Active People Healthy Nation is something that people, I think, generally can buy into. And so, you know, hashtagging active people on social media, um, and so forth. And then finally, I would just say, just a few mo months ago, we provided an example of a proclamation on our website that elected leaders can adapt or uh, to show their support for the work that we're doing. So, um, so far, we've had good success early on, Maricopa County, uh, uh, another smaller city, the city of Buckeye, Arizona, city of Decatur, Georgia, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the state of South Dakota have all adopted this proclamation. So this is a way for you at the local level, if you'd like to get um, an identity and associated with active people from a, a more formal perspective. And I think so far we've got roughly about 5 million people covered in the United States. So we're 2% of the way there and we have 98% of the way to go. So um, your listeners could really help us and, 
in um, getting there. And then finally, if you um, do get proclamations uh, uh, adopted in your communities, we'd love to hear about it. And you can email us at activepeople at cdc.gov. It's pretty easy. Activepeople at cdc.gov. Um, I think there are a number of other ways that you can engage in your communities, but I'll and I'm happy to go into more detail, but in, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop right now and just, you know, ask you if you'd like to hear more. Well, and, and I think uh, this is a great teaser because we want people to click on through and get over there. So this is another reminder that, yes, I will have all the appropriate links in the show notes and in the video description. So don't worry. Fear not. When you're done listening to us, you can head right on over there and uh, click on those links. So to, to kind of wrap this up, what advice do you have for our audience if they're inspired to really create change in their neighborhoods? I, I think I already know one of the answers, and that is get involved with active, active People Healthy Nation. What, what else do you think you know, w would be helpful for, for folks to, if they're inspired to make a difference in their neighborhood? Well, I mean, first of all, recognize that the work that we do through Active People Healthy Nation is important work that improves individual well-being, it promotes health equity and community resilience. And to be honest, like, you know, the work that promotes physical activity doesn't necessarily need to be uh, labeled as physical activity. They're, you know, understanding that Active People Healthy Nation, our goal is to get is to, to get the support for conditions under which physical activity is um, is there. But it doesn't need to be led that way if it that's not what works in your community, right? So, and and I say that because every community is different. So, uh, you know, my advice would be to start by learning what your community plans and needs are for supporting activity-friendly routes to everyday destinations. And because understanding where your community is will help you better understand where you might engage. And then, once you do understand kind of where your own community is, we have a number of resources available on our website, as you just said, uh, that can help you with, say, communication materials. Uh, we have uh, collateral materials like Active People Healthy Nation design element that you can get directly from our uh, website and put on your own promotion materials if you want to at the local level. We have a number of fact sheets that, uh, under, that, that, that describe the benefits of investing in what we call activity-friendly routes to everyday destinations. Um, we have uh, access to media materials. If you're in media and you want access to free collateral media materials, you can join our Community Health uh, uh, Resource Center. And then we ha we've we support a number of partners out there that have technical tools, such as um, the Safe Routes to Schools report cards or the National Complete Streets uh, Benefits uh, Index. And so um, there are a number of different um, technical resources on our website. And then finally, um, I will say that uh, Supporting the strategies, there you know there are other strategies as I mentioned earlier. We've talked a lot about creating activity-friendly routes to everyday destinations, but there are other ways to get started as well. Um, so you can encourage your schools to be, in, you know, increase access to physical activity in the schools, or uh, increase access to youth physical activity opportunities in your communities um, for low or uh, no cost of uh, uh, sporting uh, activities, for example. Um, you can um, open up local assets like schoolyards to the broader community through what we call shared use agreements or even install wayfinding to help people understand walking routes in your communities or ways to walk to places. You can support uh, social, what we call social support programs like walking clubs for, say, older adults or women of color. Or um, you can uh, invest in community challenges to increase physical activity. Or finally, you can, you know, combine multiple strategies and what we call community-wide campaigns to increase physical activity. I mention all of these because they all have credible scientific evidence of effectiveness. And investing in any of these that I just mentioned will help to um, increase physical activity in your community. And then I would just, you know, I would end with whatever the strategy you choose, it is important to engage people who have been impacted by health equity to reduce health disparities and work with these communities to you understand the most culturally appropriate solutions. Fantastic. That is great. And you reminded me, I need to work on my strength training. 
<laughs> I, get, I get the cardio in, but you know, it's like I'm 56 now, and you know, it's especially as we get older, we need to, to make sure we get that in as well. And I loved how you just slipped that in. You get you got all seven of the strategies taken care of. I love it. That's fantastic. Ken Rose is the branch chief for physical activity and health. And within the division of nutrition, physical activity, and obesity at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Ken, it has been an honor to chat with you here today. Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's certainly been an honor for me. And just uh, go out and join Active People Healthy Nation. Thanks so much. Thank you all so very much for tuning in to episode number 94 of the Active Towns podcast. I really hope you found it helpful to hear from Ken about the fantastic work being done at the Physical Activity and Health Branch. I know for me, it was a good reminder that we have access to a tremendous treasure trove of resources on their website. And I have provided many of those links in the show notes and on the landing page for this episode at activetowns.org. Well, folks, that's all for this week's episode. But as a final reminder, please help me grow the culture of activity movement by making a donation, spreading the word, and subscribing. Thank you all so very much for your support and for tuning in. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. <laughs>